I, I just want to make sure that I impart to you mm-hmm. that for which I thought we should meet during this mm-hmm. Passover. Mm-hmm. For reasons that I cannot fully explain, it seems we are beginning a new time cycle. And it may be a time cycle of seven years for two reasons. One reason is because as we got into the new decade of 2020, or actually the Hebrew 80s, the first three years are now behind us. And they were three very challenging years that we were like walking through the valley of the shadow of death, both in the church and globally. The world, the whole world has walked through the valley of the shadow of death. So now we have seven years through to the end of the decade, but that's not the only reason why I speak about a seven-year cycle. It has come to my attention that in the lives of other people or ministries, it seems like seven-year cycles or multiples of seven-year cycles were completed by the end of 22. So it seems the Lord has confirmed the significance of this new cycle of seven years. This is just an indication. It's just evidence. It does not in itself have a great strength uh, where we are concerned because, okay, whether it's five or seven or 14, like what do we care? The only thing that we want to take away from it is that there is a call from God. There is a message for a new beginning. And that word is heard from other voices as well, that this is a time of a new beginning. So the first thing that prevails is the concept of a new beginning. Then there is a second concept that prevails, like an invitation from the Lord. And that has also been confirmed. Uh, For example, in my case, I received it, Evie received it separately from me. And one more person received it that God is saying, we are shooting for a breakthrough. We are pushing for a breakthrough, that the breakthrough is at hand and we are called to break through. Now, breakthrough is also a new concept, is another way of speaking about Passover, except it's more dramatic because it's not just simply Passover, but it's actually breaking through into something completely new or breaking through obstacles or breaking through walls or breaking through strongholds to break through to something new. Now, to to, to enhance the strength of what that means, I need to go back several months. And I don't remember right now when it was that I had a vision but it was definitely in the second half of 22. And as we were in the midst of the realization that the church, the Greek church that had started after the coronavirus and through the coronavirus um, um, forced lockdowns, that Greek church that I had concluded that the Lord wanted me to, to pastor we were coming in the real, to the realization it was falling apart, things were not working, people were leaving, there was no grace for that. Mm-hmm. I was not feeling well in my spirit even before people started leaving because I was feeling this is not what I'm called to do, and this church is not going the way that I want it to go, and it doesn't seem like I, I can even affect it to, to, to go in the direction I want to go. Why? Because the people who had come could not catch the vision. They were not interested in the vision. And and in the midst of all that, the Lord showed me a vision. And in the vision, I was walking in a tube, which was something like one and a half meters wide. So I had to bend to walk through it. I'm not going to tell you all the details. There was a lot of details that were important at that time. But the thing is that tube was underground and it went under a huge mountain. We are talking about a huge mountain that cannot be crossed, but it you can go under it. And actually, in the dream, I saw how I was how the enemy tried to allure me into taking an opening. And if I took that opening that was opening up to my left, I would go out of that tube 
but I would be before the mountain. I would stay in the valley before the mountain, and I would not cross over or cross under, in this case, to the new land. Mm -hmm. So I did not fall in the trap. I did not go out of the tube. I said, I'm going to carry on until I reach the other end. And then in the vision, in the experience, that tube eventually began to become wider and wider and eventually was as wide as a tube that is like three meters wide in diameter. And then the light was very strong in front of me. And as I reached the end, and after, you know, the, the original blinding that comes from the bright light, you, you begin to see what's out there. It's a new valley. It was a new valley full of grass, green grass and trees that were still baby trees, but they were growing. And it was like, like, like a huge garden, a very well cared garden. And anyway, all that is a background to say that we've come to this Passover. And by now, it was clear Shalom Center had to stop. Today was the last, the last, last, last thing that needed to happen. Today, a technician from the electric company went there to officially close mm -hmm. the supply of the electricity, which was in my name. So now I'm really completely free from that place. Mm -hmm. And it happened in this Passover, in the process of this Passover. It could have happened earlier, but there were all kinds of delays. Imagine one of those delays, you know why it came? Because the technician, the morning that he was supposed to come, he found out his car was stolen. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry for the poor guy, but I'm saying like things could not work, mm -hmm. but they did during this Passover. Yeah. So this Passover, I had understood the call of God was, this is the time to come out of the tube. Mm -hmm. Through this Passover is a passing over to the new land, the Huge mountain, the stronghold is behind us. We 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 left it behind us. We crossed over. We made it. And this is it. We made it. But there still is a need for a last push through these few days of the Pesach, of the Passover. Interestingly, the Lord put in the hearts of Daryl and Debbie, this couple missionaries from Albania. So just I'm going to show you. Actually, one, one more reason why I'm going to show you these photographs is because they are a manifestation of the new thing, the passing over. It's a, it's a testimony of the passing over. Mm -hmm. So here we are in a church downtown Athens. This is Daryl and Debbie. And um, here we are with Evie. So this Passover is a time of breakthrough. This Passover is a time to enter a new valley. And this new valley may be the fullness of the word which I had received at the end of 2019, that there was a calling to defeat Jericho. And so all the emphasis in the first half of, the, of 2020 was defeat Jericho, overcome Jericho. I think I did a few in English, but not all, of how there was a progress and a process because it was not just the Jericho stronghold. There were other things associated with crossing Jordan. And one of the major things that needed to happen was the shift of mentality in God's people from what it was like to live in the desert where everything was provided by God supernaturally, to learning how to live in a land that was the land of the promise, but they had to do things. And one of them is they had to start making their own bread out of what the land produced. And how they had to become circumcised, which means to leave behind them what should not enter the promised land. And actually the circumcision in Gilgal, one way to see it is they had to circumcise, they had to cut off the memory of the desert. Mm. 
They had to embrace the memory of the, they had to, to embrace the new mindset of the promised land. Mm. Okay, I don't want to go back three years. The point is, after Jericho, there was war with other cities. And we've been through three years of wars. What is this Passover? To me, it's the time to finally dwell in the promised land. To finally begin the dwelling of the promised land. It's finally the time for us to begin experience to begin experiencing the promises. It is an amazing time. It is a it is a it defies logic. It, it's like beyond anything I can imagine. The new thing that is ahead is so incredible, is so promising, is so lovely. It's what we've lived for. It's what is the reason we exist. And it has to do with manifesting the kingdom of God on earth. So I've been seeking the Lord about why Shalom Center had to close. Because there is no doubt that it was God who closed it. The same Lord who provided the people from the beginning when we started. The same God at this time stopped providing people. So really the the house of prayer really ended in the summer of 2020. So, Lord, why did you close it? Why did you close it? I don't understand it. We had something good going on. Well, one, that was in the desert. Mm -hmm. Now we are in the promised land. We have to leave behind us everything that was in the desert, as good as that was. It served its purpose but you've crossed over to a new land. So it's time for a new beginning. It's time for something new that you have no clue what it's like because you haven't done it before. You're walking a path. You're waking, walking on a path that you haven't walked on before. Which is why the Lord was saying, as he was showing why it's so significant that we do the seven days, the, the, the Passover thing. The Lord was showing to me there is a great need for a change of the mindset, a redesigning of the very thought process that processes the things of God, that processes the understanding of what he's saying, it's like God was saying, I want to redesign your brain. I want you to think in a way that you were not able to think until now. I want you to grasp and understand new concepts or concepts that you thought you understood. I want you to be able to understand them in a new light, mm -hmm. in a new perspective. I believe this is the time for the Lord to bring new life with a new perspective to the concept and the vision and the mission of houses of prayer. Because we have known to some degree what a house of prayer is like, but in a previous, let's call it setting, a previous era, a previous mindset. And it was a mindset that had been shaped while we were walking in the desert. Basically, let, let, let me go back to 2019. End of 2019, beginning of, to, of, of the new decade, the Lord is showing me the new things for the new decade. In the beginning of 2020, I did the document that the Lord led me to say that the title, the theme over the new decade is uh, Brace for Impact. Yeah. yeah. In it, I, I had a section concerning the house of prayer. Okay, point number one. God spoke a new something in the new decade for the house of prayer. But there is a second point. Let's talk about the ecclesia. A key message for the new decade is the transition from the church to ecclesia. 
And I, I, I hope I don't need to expound on this right now. I think you have a better understanding than most people. Okay. And uh, now let's bring together the, the, the house of prayer and the ecclesia. Until now, over the last 20 years, especially since like the turn of the millennium, 23 years now, there was a house of prayer movement, and, and the, the spearhead of that was the I Hope Kansas City, Mike Bickle kind of, of, of house of prayer. I suppose it goes back even beyond, even, even earlier. It's, it's not, it didn't really start in, in, in 2000, but it was mostly after the millennium, after the year 2000, that the I Hope Kansas City exploded. And there was a major move around the globe of people starting houses of prayer, people starting 24-7, as they called it, even though the vast majority have never made 24-7. It's just almost impossible unless you have many, many, many people available who can keep the, the shifts. But the point is, so there is a house of prayer movement. And what is the primary characteristic of that prayer movement? Total dissociation and separation from the church. From the church. It's a parachurch movement, and in many cases, it is against the church. Why? Because many of the people who start houses of prayer have been rejected by churches, have had conflict with pastors. They were rebellious people. They didn't want to have anything to do with authority, and maybe. They were right. Maybe there was false authority. Maybe the pastors were not even spirit-filled people. Maybe they could not care less about God's plans. They were serving their own plans. But here is not a time to look into why. The fact is the church is one movement, one stream, and the house of prayer is another stream. That's the fact. So what's new in the new decade? The Lord said, I will merge the two into the true ecclesia. An ecclesia that in the heart is a house of prayer, but also serves the other purposes of the ecclesia. Because actually the ecclesia is not run, running a religious service. The call of the body of Christ is to be a legislative body of authority that by prayer shapes, affects, defines, determines the spirit realm. Mm. It's the 1 Timothy chapter 2 principle that it's paraphrased by me in the following concept as the church, as the ecclesia. Praise for the authorities as well as for all the people. The society can begin to live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness and reverence. And, and if you haven't heard me do the teaching on that, let me not shift into teaching now, but the short version is you cannot have in a Roman Empire of Paul with Nero the emperor, you cannot expect to have any place where there's godliness and reverence. And yet Paul did the teaching to Timothy, which means he had never experienced it. He could not ever experience it in his lifetime, but he still produced the teaching that when the Ecclesia prays, for the kings and those in authority, people can live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness and reverence, which means what? A changed spirit realm mm. at societal level, at governmental level. Mm. But the church was always meant to be the ecclesia that legislates. And if you haven't heard or if you have forgotten my teaching on the ecclesia, um, a very important key to understand is this. The prevailing word throughout the scriptures about the religious gathering of the Jews was what? Synagogue. Mm -hmm. Jesus attended the synagogue meetings, taught at their synagogues. It's throughout the scriptures. And then he goes and says to his disciples, I will build up my... And he doesn't use the word synagogue. So the purpose of the body of Christ is not to replace the religious synagogues by Christian synagogues. 
But Jesus wanted to build something that had nothing to do with anything associated with the synagogues. Jesus did not say, I will build an alternative religious gathering. He said, I will build up my ecclesia. And what's the purpose of my ecclesia? The purpose of my ecclesia is to tear down the gates of Hades. Mm. That's legislation power. That's governmental power. That's strategic power. So, house of prayer in this new era. Mm. It is no longer a term dissociated and separate from what is church. But actually, now we need a redefining of the Ecclesia. And in this redefining, in this new definition, you cannot separate the house of prayer from what God called his church, his Ecclesia. And let me bring into the bigger picture something that you may have known, but maybe you have forgotten through time. In 2017, at the end of 17, actually, I started from August. From August of 2017, I started speaking about the next move of God, the next stage of the Reformation after the first 500 years since Luther's Reformation. And the key message that I was bringing forward was this, that in the next move, the next the next stage of the Reformation, what God was going to, one way to see it is to change the doctrine of the church, but it's really not an accurate translation, it's not an accurate concept because he doesn't want to change the concept of the church because there is no concept of the church. There is no doctrine of the church. People are doing religious services in the image and likeness of the pagan services that were syncretized into the Catholic Church, and then the Catholic Church services became Pentecostal, Protestant, Evangelical. So there is no doctrine of the Ecclesia in the first 500 years of the Reformation. And when you look at all the stages of the Reformation, starting with salvation by faith, going towards the end of the 500 years being what? First, the restoration of the office of the prophet, then the restoration of the office of the apostle. So throughout the 500 years and the stages of reformation, really, there was never a reformation of the church as a concept, as a doctrine, as a practice. So this is the first time that there will even be a doctrine of the ecclesia, which would be called ecclesiology and the house of prayer is no longer going to be dissociated from the ecclesia because you cannot have church without the house of prayer when you have church without the house of prayer you have a body without heart so for the true church to emerge to become an ecclesia the heart must be the house of prayer so we need to rethink and reshape everything And for that, an important calling of people like myself is to help the body of Christ understand the transition and to help them begin to live it out. Mm -hmm. People who want to know, people who want to learn, people who want to understand the new things that God is doing. Mm -hmm. And all of that all of that, all of that, at least spiritually speaking, require what? Require a new resurrection. The resurrection of truth. The resurrection of truth that will remove the death of deception and religion and will help the body of Christ reshape into what God had always intended, but we needed to get through 500 years of gradual reformation to even come anywhere closer to the understanding of the new thing to which God has called us. 
So all that was other than sharing information with you. It was to explain why this Passover spiritually is significant. Mm -hmm.